this. Look at all this flannel. I don't know how I managed to read 19 books. So like, I don't, I don't, that's, that should be an alter ego altogether. Like, what do we call her? Hello my greeting friends, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new, my name is Mel and today I am here to discuss all the books that I read in February, also known as my February wrap up and I read a total of 19 books. I don't know how I did it, I feel like that should be an entirely different alter ego for myself because I have never in my life read 19 books in a month. I most of the time barely get to 12 books, don't know how I did it. So today we're gonna discuss all those books that I read, grab your snacks, I don't know how long this video will be, I will try and keep it as short and sweet as I humanly can. I also found some of my favorite books this month, so I am just overall excited to discuss them. And speaking about favorite books that I read this month, books of the month, I just need to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast growing online book service for readers. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors and help readers discover books that they love. Their team vets hundreds of books each month and gives readers their choice from a curated selection of new and early release titles so you can spend more time reading and less time researching. Book of the Month is also risk-free. You can skip any month, any time, and you will not be charged for that month. As you guys know, I have been subscribed to Book of the Month for months now and I absolutely love what they offer to readers out there. The fact that you can get hardcover fiction, new titles, or early release titles for much less than what they go for is fantastic because that means that you guys can get more books for less money. You guys know I love myself a good deal. And they also sent me all of the books that they picked for March. And let me tell you, the struggle to pick just one book is unreal. And for their historical fiction of the month, they have chosen The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. For fans of Daisy Jones and the Six, a rollicking tale with equal parts rock and roll and black feminist punk spirit. Their literary fiction pick is What's Mine and Yours by Naima Coster. And this multi-generational novel with warm and empathy manages to trace the lives of two families in a divided southern community. Their thriller pick for this month, I am super excited to read this, is Too Good To Be True by Carola Lovering. Unsettling and twisted, this creepy thriller will make you wonder which of his narrators is telling the truth. And not to break the continuity of the video, but the fact that we have unreliable narrators in this thriller, you know my heart is buzzing. This, I need to read this month. The next one we have is In A Book Club Far Away by Tiff Marcello. Estranged friends reconnect to heal past wounds in this heartwarming story of friendship, forgiveness, and army life. And last but not least, another one that I really want to squeeze in this month is The Last Apothecary by Sarah Pedder. Forget healing solves or soothing tinctures, this apothecary specializes in one thing, helping women fight back. So if you do want to sign up for Book of the Month, I will be leaving a link down below so that you can click that and use the code BOOKBUD to get your first book for $9.99. So a huge thank you to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video and without further ado, let's get into all the books that I read in February. Okay y'all, so some stats for the month of February before I get fully into it. I read a total of 19 books, again don't ask me why, it will forever remain a mystery how I did that in 28 days, and I read 7,203 pages. I don't know how I ate that many pages. I don't know what sort of adrenaline I was running with. So the first thing thing I read in February was actually Saga Volume 3 and as you guys know I have been loving Saga ever since I started it. It's definitely one of those graphic novels that I instantly fell in love with. It has kind of this mix between the maturity of Game of Thrones and the themes that Game of Thrones has and the spacey sci-fi element that Star Wars would bring to the table. So if those two were to have a baby I do agree that Saga would be that baby and the first and second volume to me were stellar. I love how they introduced me to the world World. They were truly fantastic. We do follow two people from opposite side of the war as they fall in love and they have a baby and that is obviously illegal. That is bringing a lot of turmoil, extra turmoil into this war and so they are being hunted for having this baby. And the second volume ended in a cliffhanger. So I was extra excited to go into this one to kind of find out where we go from there. The only thing was starting volume three, it kind of backtracked a little bit too much 
for my personal taste. We backtracked, I believe, to like the beginning, mid of volume two. And we came to the end of volume two, almost at the final third of volume three. So it did feel kind of anticlimactic in a way, like that excitement that I had kind of died down as I kept reading. Because I was like, when are we going to get to where the cliffhanger was? So I ended up giving it a three out of five stars. So kind of middle of the range. It wasn't necessarily bad, but it wasn't necessarily stellar. I definitely feel like I read this twice. 20 years ago, but in reality, it was a month ago. The next book I read is Punching the Air by Evie Zaboy and Dr. Yusuf Salam. But Punching the Air is a novel in verse, and we follow particularly Amal Shahid, who has been an artist and a poet for his entire life. He goes to a very diverse art school, but even if the school is diverse, there are a lot of biased systems in place that he has been able to notice as the weeks go on. And unfortunately, one night, he finds himself in an altercation in a gentrifying neighborhood neighborhood alongside some other boys. And at 16 years old, Amal finds himself wrongfully imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. And this book is definitely an exploration of the lack of justice and the wrongful accusation to young black men in particular, and how the judicial system truly does nothing to find out the truth when it involves this particular demographic. It was mostly infuriating to read how these things go down and the lack of justice that happens happens in these particular cases. And it was also so heartbreaking to see Amal in this situation that he never thought he'd find himself in, but things that unfortunately black parents always have to warn their kids about. And so we follow him all throughout his early journey in prison. And then we also kind of see him in school interacting with his peers and with this particular girl that he really, really likes. And the way that the poems went, it was just so focused on art and painting and craft. It was so heartbreaking beautiful. I don't think I could use any other words to describe what it felt like beside that because the way that Amal really just wanted to create, he was an artist through and through and he was deprived of all of that and he was thrust into an unfair system that clearly has a bias, that clearly does not care for the truth and it was infuriating and heartbreaking to see how he just wanted to be a normal kid with some paint and a brush to tell his truth and even when he told his truth from prison, it was taken away from him. I gave this a 5 out of 5 stars. It was definitely one of my favorite books that I read in February. Oh boy, oh boy, the next book I read was You Had Me at Ola by Alexis Daria. And you guys know I was very interested in this book primarily because not only did it follow Latinx characters, but we also primarily followed two actors who have been newly hired for this soap opera, for this telenovela. And they try and build that chemistry that they need to have on screen. Off the screen, off the stage, behind the scenes, and it obviously starts developing into sort of more steamy kind of relationship than they expected from the very beginning. So this book for me was equal parts, I loved it and then I didn't like it. And let me break this down because I feel it kind of is with a reason. So the first thing that I will say, I adored the production aspect of this book. Consent was a big part of this, not only for the two characters off screen, but also the characters on screen, on stage. And that is also very accurate with how things go down with acting. Again, in theater, there is like a chemistry core Coordinator, there is staging for intimate scenes. All of that is staged and blocked before you actually go on scene to act it out just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable. And that part of the book, I was just beaming when I saw that in this book because it was just so, again, accurate. I was over the moon excited. The cast of this book was also a breath of fresh air. All of the characters were Latinx or they were a part of the LGBTQIA plus community. So all of that was fantastic to see. I really love the way that the author seamlessly incorporated all of these characters into the story without it feeling unnatural or forced. So that part of the book was fantastic. But where my issue comes in with this book is the romance. I absolutely loved the scenes that we got within the telenovela and I felt like their chemistry, their relationship, their romance behind the scenes didn't feel as justified as it could have been and their connection did feel underdeveloped. I think these two characters are the prime example of because we are meant to look in love and be in love on camera, that chemistry, that love, that appreciation that our characters have for each other is bleeding onto our personal life 
lives, but it doesn't necessarily represent our feelings, our real feelings towards each other. Also, the conflict in this book felt very minuscule and the resolution even more so. I was not happy at all with that and I think that's just an issue I just have with our romances in general because I always feel like the conflict is either due to miscommunication, it's either because of an outside force creating some sort of drama and it doesn't feel real enough for me and the resolution is like, oh, we could have talked about this all along, but we didn't. That's exactly what the conflict felt like. But overall, I couldn't get past this book being a three star. I won't bore you with this one because I do have an entire review up for this book, so I will leave that link down below. But the next book I read is Muted by Tammy Charles. This is an arc, so that's why it's not in its usual hardcover form. But I read Muted by Tammy Charles this month and I gave it a four out of five stars. This one is an exploration of the darker side of the music industry following a girl group by the name of Angelic Voices. And we particularly follow our three main girls, Denver, Dolly, and Shaq, as they meet Sean Mercury Ellis, who promises them the world, all the record deals, all the fame, and they get carried away into this world, into this kind of rabbit hole of fame and drinking and drugs with this person whom, again, has promised them absolutely everything. And it was, I think, particularly heartbreaking because it was in verse, but there were so many other things that this book explored that I just really enjoyed. Familial dynamics, as you guys know, is one of my favorite things to read about. And I think this book did that so well. But again, I won't bore you too much. I do have an entire review up for this, so I will leave that link down below in case you do want to check it out. And the next book I read is actually The Space Between Worlds by Micaiah Johnson. And this one, before I even start, this book does have trigger warnings, particularly for abuse slash domestic abuse. And then also a theme that is very prominent throughout the book is suicidal thoughts. So just be aware of those trigger warnings before you do want to dive in. But in this book, we explore what we call the multiverse and doppelgangers. And we in particular follow Kara because 372 of her doppelgangers have died. And now with eight remaining and one suddenly mysteriously dead, she is on a quest to find out exactly what has happened to this other self. And in the midst of that, she kind of starts uncovering a conspiracy theory from the multiverse that could not only only put her in danger, but the entirety of the multiverse in danger. I think the conversation around multiverse, how they discover the multiverse, and how to travel between worlds and doppelgangers, and in particular how their system works, where one of your other selves is alive in one world, you can't enter it because if not you will die. I think the whole, I guess, magic system, I guess is what you could call it, or the system that the author wrote for this book was so incredibly interested and intricate and it was executed in such a fantastic way for such a short book. I think that's what really kind of astounded me with this novel was how the author managed to do so much in so little. I really do think Micaiah Johnson knows how to use her words. Micaiah Johnson knows how to freaking write. The writing in this was absolutely beautiful. I found some fantastic quotes in here and I think it really does make you question a lot about life and one's purpose in this world, in this universe. I think some of the bigger themes tackled in this book were along the lines of humankind's greediness and how we constantly, as a society, we continuously take and take and take without ever asking, without ever wondering. We just take because it's there up for grabs. And it also wonderfully so managed to establish the conversation of race and how white people think themselves superior to black people. And in this book, they literally use them to do their bidding because they don't want to do it themselves. So I think this book in all of those aspects was phenomenal. I think where my kind of disappointment, I guess you could call it, would come from is that the conflict that was introduced in the book wasn't necessarily what I was expecting and the book took a route that I also wasn't necessarily expecting. The synopsis also really flashes how Kara and Del, who is her co-worker, are constantly flirting and how they want to be with each other and I feel that was more Kara pining for Del and a lot of miscommunication and secrets in between that I wasn't necessarily in love with. I just feel like that part of the book felt 
fell short for me. But overall, everything else I really enjoyed. I ended up giving it a 3.5. I also found a new favorite book in February and I am so excited that I read this. I just need to thank Jalisa from Bounded and Bookmarked because the way that if it wasn't because of her, I probably wouldn't have heard of this book as soon as I did. And that is Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston. I love this book so much. Like I just need more books in this series right now. I just need this to be like a 10 book series. I don't care how many books would be in this series. I would read every single one of them because the world that B.B. Alston created for this middle grade, it just, it has so much potential. There's so much that can be done here. The possibilities are endless. And in this book, we follow Amari Peters after her brother Quinton has disappeared. And although there is a police investigation in place for her brother's disappearance, the police constantly tell her family that Quinton probably sided with the wrong people, got into some shady business, and that is why he's no longer at home. They never give Quinton any benefit of the doubt. They just continuously want to fit Quinton into this mold that he does not fit in. And so Amari obviously very desperate to find her brother that she has a really tight connection with. That was one of my favorite parts of this book. Their connection was just beautiful. Takes it upon herself to try and find her brother. And so one day she finds a briefcase sent to her by her brother. And that briefcase brings a nomination as the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs. And now Amari finds herself competing against these kids that have known magic their entire life. So she feels at a disadvantage. And to top it all off, she finds out her power is illegal. This book was just so freaking good. The magic system that B.B. Alston created for this blew my mind. If you have read this book, The Elevators, you knew about The Elevators. The trials in this book were also phenomenal. I just found myself constantly rooting for Amari, even though everything, all the odds were against her. And my heart just broke for her in those moments and how she truly just wanted to belong and to create a space for herself and to prove people wrong and to prove people that not everything is what it seems and not everything is what they have seen. And I just love the way that Amari was so decided and driven and passionate about finding her brother that she would literally go to the ends of the earth to find him and be with him. But my girl Jaleesa does have an entire reading vlog on this so I will leave it linked down below because I think nobody will talk with more passion about this book than she did and I cried watching her vlog. She just talked about it so perfectly and so again if you just want to hear all the thoughts I will leave her vlog linked down below. I also think I didn't say it I rated it five out of five stars if it wasn't obvious by me just not saying a single negative thing about the book it's a five out of five stars. All right the next two things that I read and I say two things because they go hand in hand are the first two volumes for Heartstopper by Alice Oseman. Now these are graphic novels and I love them so much I really need to get volume three and I also need to get the novella for Nick and Charlie because I have completely, utterly fallen in love with these two characters and their journey, and I cannot wait to read more. But in Heartstopper, we follow Nick and Charlie as they meet, and they form a really wholesome friendship. They are both now in the rugby team, and so that's kind of where their friendship starts developing. And we see their friendship blossom into something more, into a little bit more of a romantic friendship, a romantic relationship. But we do get a lot of exploration of sexuality and embracing yourself and what exactly you identify as, who exactly it is that you want to present yourself to the world as, and just kind of doing that in your own terms, under your own rules, under your own time, with no pressure and no outside forces kind of weighing in on you. It was just such a wholesome story. I cannot wait to find out more about these two just incredibly wholesome people. Both of these were also five stars, in my opinion. Ooh, next graphic novel I read in February, and this is where it gets kind of tricky for me because after reading Heartstopper, I was like, oh my god, wholesome vibes. Oh my god, wholesome feels. I want more graphic novels. And so I picked up Bloom by Kevin Panetta, I believe, yes. And this graphic novel was definitely not 
what is sold to you in the synopsis. So in this graphic novel, we follow Ari, who has big dreams of making it with his ultra hip band, and he wants to move out of town. He wants to go to one of these bigger cities, and the only thing holding him back is the family business, which is a bakery. So Ari, out of his own too, goes ahead and starts hunting for someone who can fill his job at his family's bakery. And that is where he meets Hector, a boy who is studying culinary arts, and a boy who knows exactly what he does in the kitchen, so he is the perfect candidate to fulfill Ari's role, and they start working together, and according to the synopsis, their relationship starts blooming into love. Y'all, when I tell you this did not bloom into love until like the last 10 pages maybe of the graphic novel, the main focus of this book was Ari being stubborn, not wanting to leave his family's business. On top of that as well, it was Ari disregarding kind of his parents' feelings and their business and the fact that they really did want him to stay back here in some shape or form. He is also kind of mean to Hector at the beginning for absolutely no reason. I think my main issue with the graphic novel was Ari. I just don't think Ari is necessarily a compelling character. I didn't necessarily see his growth throughout the graphic novel. I ended up giving it a three star anyway, like it was still very enjoyable. I was still turning those pages obviously very quickly. It is a graphic novel. So yeah, just don't think that they're gonna be in love for the majority of this because it's not. Next up, I have Sadie by Courtney Summers. And you guys know already, I loved Sadie. I just need to preface this by saying I gave Sadie a 4.5. One of the best audiobooks I have ever heard in my life sound effects, it had a full cast of characters, it also had a podcast element, so all of that just elevated the experience in my opinion. There are trigger warnings for this book though, so just be aware of those. We have sexual assault, we have pedophilia, we also have abuse, and we also have drug use and abuse. And in Sadie, we follow Sadie, obviously, as she has grown up in a very unusual way. She didn't have the easiest upbringing, in fact, she kind of had to take this caretaker role for her sister, and so that ends up creating a very tight-knit bond between these two sisters. It ends up creating a sense of loyalty that goes beyond sisterhood. So when Maddie is found dead, Sadie takes it upon herself to seek revenge and justice for her sister's life. And on the flip side of things, we also have Wes, who is a radio personality and he finds himself in a deserted gas station, technically in the middle of nowhere, and he overhears somebody talking about Sadie's case and her disappearance, and he finds it really interesting that not a lot of people are talking about this. So he also takes it upon himself to start investigating what exactly is happening with Sadie and her sister Maddie. And oh my god, that podcast element, it felt like I was watching a documentary. I was stripped out for the majority of the audiobook and I was like, damn, this feels too real. Like I feel I am literally, because I had my eyes closed for a lot of the time because I was listening. So I was just like, damn, I feel like I'm watching a movie right now or like a documentary. It feels so cool. I also think this falls under the darker side side of YA, but that is something that with Sadie in particular, it works. It works because it talks about the loyalty that these two sisters had for each other and the love that Sadie found herself having for her sister and that she would walk to the ends of the earth to find her and bring justice for her death. And so I think that part of the book was not only the most beautiful, but also the most heartbreaking. And I think also the podcast element just provided a lot of insight, info, and also a lot of truth to the story and it made it feel more realistic, it made it feel more current, it made it feel more important in a way. I feel like this is a book that is hard to talk about if you're not going in depth about what happens in here. I will just say though, get yourself the audiobook if you can and just listen to this. All right, I also read an Acevedo this month and I read With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo. I will preface this by saying not my favorite Acevedo. I think my thing with this book is I just don't know if I quite enjoy her prose as much as her verse. I think there's just something so beautiful about the way that she writes in verse that is so compelling and the story just kind of elevates in my opinion. I have also realized after reading this book, I love that I read this book and I will say that. However, let me just give you a brief synopsis for this book so that I can then go into what I realized I didn't particularly like. So in this book, we follow Emani Santiago 
and she is a teen mom. And alongside her abuela, she manages to take care of Emmy, who is her daughter. She is now struggling with a lot of different things and expectations of taking care of her daughter, making enough money to take care of her daughter, graduating high school, figuring out what she wants to do after high school. So she is juggling a lot of different things at once. And I think that is one of the more admirable traits of Imani as a main character. And the only place that she can let all of that lose is in the kitchen. She definitely wants to pursue the culinary arts aspect. She definitely wants to be a chef. I have just realized after reading this book that I don't particularly enjoy reading about teen moms and teen pregnancy. It's just not one of those topics that I in particular find myself drawn to as I am drawn to other things in writing. But I am glad that I read this though. I think it was again very admirable the strength that Imani possesses as a character and the way that she manages to adapt so quickly to things that are outside of her natural element, if you want to call it that. I think the devotion that she has for her daughter and for her family was also beautiful. And I also think her friendship with her best friend was beautifully done. And I think one of my main issues that later turned into something that I liked was the romantic element to this book. She is kind of introduced to this guy called Malachi that she starts developing a romance with. At the beginning, it just did not feel organic to me. It felt forced. His intentions at first also I was kind of iffy about them. He just seemed too forceful of a person. But at the end, I did fall in love with their dynamic and their romance. I think the one downfall of this book as well was Imani was so stubborn and she always thought that she was right and there could be no wrong, especially if she said so. So if anybody surrounding her would tell her that maybe take this different approach because XYZ, particularly with her mentor Chef, she would literally go against everything Thing that they would tell her just because she wants to and she can and she thinks it's the right move. It was kind of frustrating to see Imani not realize that what you think is not necessarily always the right thing to do or the right thing to say. And so there were just elements that I couldn't get past with this book. I was just kind of like, can this book be over? So I definitely didn't enjoy this as much as other Acevedo's, but I did read it and it was still kind of enjoyable. So I gave it a three, 3.5. I also don't know how I did this. In such a short amount of time, I guess I could say. I also read these <laughs> in February. I read A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Maas, which is the third book in the Akatar series. I also read the novella, A Court of Frost and Starlight, and I read the newest book, A Court of Silver Flames, all in one month. A Court of Silver Flames. I have an entire spoiler-filled vlog for this if you want to check that out. I will leave that linked down below. It is quite lengthy. I have talked about this book a lot. There is also a spoiler free review at the end. So as to not be too repetitive, in this one we follow Nesta and Cassian instead of Feyre, which is our main character in the main trilogy. And in this one we follow Nesta after obviously these two books. Follow her as she is trying to come to terms with her new life, a life that she did not ask for, a life that she never thought she would live. And with that comes a lot of resentment and substance abuse and self-sabotage. There's just a lot in here that I definitely was not expecting from an SJM book, but also things that I was obviously expecting with the representation of mental health and how PTSD and trauma manifests itself differently for a lot of people. And so I just, I, I adored this book. I adored Nesta's journey. There will be a live show for A Court of Silver Flames this month. I have yet to define the date and time. Hopefully I'll have this up and ready by the end of the week. Along with that, obviously, for the Thorns and Roses along for the month of February, it was the time to read Aquawar and Aquafas. Aquawar was an interesting case of, it, this is the first time that I lowered my rating for Aquawar in comparison to all the other times that I have read Aquawar. Now, I rated this instead a 3.5. Now, with Aquawar in particular, a lot of my issues with this book came in regards to the plot, which, I mean, we've been new that Aquatar is more character character driven than it is plot driven and Aquawar is the one place I'd say from the entire series where the plot shines the most. We really start seeing that conflict take place and come to fruition in this book and I just started realizing the more I read this book how plot convenient it was. It was just all around convenient for all of these characters. Nobody could stay dead. Nobody could stay bad. These characters needed to be happy at the end no matter the cost and at the end it did feel unearned in my opinion so it was kind of interesting to reread it this time around more analytically and see just and whether I really enjoy it as much as I said I did or if I enjoyed it a little less and so it was just 
is an interesting reread because I never expected to rate this lower than I did. And there is an entire Aqua War live show if you want to check out all of my thoughts and my guest host's thoughts as well. So I will be linking that down below again if you do want to check that out out, but I also read Aquafaz, which is the novella. And this novella was interesting to me in the sense that I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. This novella lives within the space, or like anywhere between like a three and a four, I guess I could say. It's weird because I enjoyed it for what it was. Like it's literally a Christmas special. It feels like a Christmas special. I don't think if you read this outside of the Christmas time, it would feel nice and good and organic and incredible. Definitely feels like a Hallmark special. The way that the book opens literally feels like the opening scene where they're just like typing up in the computer and the snow is falling and they go, it's Christmas. That's what it feels like at the beginning. And then kind of the writing starts becoming a little more typical SJM as you go. It does a great job at setting up the conflict for Akosov. I was kind of confused with some things going into Silver Flames that I feel I wouldn't have been confused if I'd read this book first. The conflict of that book is set up in here. Where some of the characters are at the beginning of that book is set up in here. So it does kind of give you a nice prologue to what is to come. Next book I read in February was Be Dazzled by Ryan Masala. And I loved this book so much. It was so wholesome. It was definitely one of those feel-good books that you can just go into and kind of disconnect from everything else. And in this one, we follow Rafi, who has a big passion for bedazzling, for craft work, for cosplay. That is what he wants to pursue professionally. That's what he's aiming for. He even has like his own little YouTube channel where he does live streams to bedazzle with people. Every single year, he also goes to these big conventions to, you know, meet fellow cosplayers, and just live in the moment of the buzz of the cosplaying. And this year he goes to this competition, this cosplay competition, and he ends up realizing that his ex-boyfriend Luca is also a competitor in this particular competition. And so we have alternating timelines in this book, both from the past, and we get to see how Rafi and Luca met, and then we see them present time competing against each other in this competition that really means a lot to Rafi. And I think what jumps out with this book and what makes it so so unique in my opinion is the fact that it focuses a lot on that crafting aspect of it on the behind the scenes of a reality tv show of a reality competition of also convention culture and how people that are really into that lifestyle live and the way that they think it was just so fascinating i knew mostly none of this and i came out with the book with so much weird knowledge about like bedazzling and like convention things and i also got to interview ryan lasala for the taylor and baker book club that was also really fun to be able to chat with the author. It was honestly such a quick read too. I read this in one sitting. It was just a fantastic book. If you have not checked this out, I highly recommend you do. This is like Project Runway meets Comic Con. That's the best way I could pitch this book. It's just incredible. I gave it a four out of five stars. And then I have the four books that I read in a 24 hour readathon, which were these four books right here. This was an interesting reading experience in the span of 24 hours, all very different genres. And so I will tell you the rating of all of these books. I won't go into them though because you are getting a 24-hour reading vlog. So Monstrous Volume 1, I gave this a 4.5. It was a really enjoyable story. It's like steampunk, monsters meet deities. Then Tweet Cute by Emma Lord, I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. There were a lot of familial dynamics in this book that I definitely was not expecting because I thought the main focus of this was going to be the romance between the two characters. This was really better than I thought it would be. Then we have The Inheritance Games, which was kind of a little bit disappointing to me. I gave it a three though, a three out of five. And then the last one I read is The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. And this book focuses primarily on clairvoyance. The characters were compelling and I do want to find out more about these characters, which is why I'm going to carry out and read hopefully the rest of the series. So I gave this a 3.5. Again, I'll go more in depth in the readathon vlog. But these were the books that I read in the readathon. Again, I'm going to in depth into them, just talking a little bit about them in my rating. And those are all the books that I have for you guys today. All of the books that I read in February. Again, a total of 19 books. Don't know how I did it. And it was overall a great reading month. I do think in comparison to January, I did have a lot more 3 slash 3.5 stars. But I think it's good that I had nothing lower than a 3. But yes, those are all the books that I have for you guys today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up and comment down below all of the books that you read in February. What were some of your favorites? And if you have read any of these, please also let me know down in the comments below. If you reached the end of the video, also let's leave like the 
purple magic ball in the comments in honor of Amari and the Night Brothers, which was definitely one of my favorites for the month of February. Don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't already for more bookish content. I am constantly uploading videos and I'm sure you do not want to miss, as well as live streaming throughout the week, doing my weekly rating sprints. And you can also follow me on all of my social medias, which are always linked down below. You guys know where to find me. And again, huge thank you to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to use the code BOOKBUT to get your first book for $9.99. I have a link to Book of the Month down below so you can check them out pretty easily. And yeah, I love you guys so, so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys.